Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, so tonight what we're going to do is be reconstructing another classic salmon fly. So this was a strange looking fly. It was in the same batch of Shannons as I got before. Uh, and what intrigued me about this one is that it had uh, a part of a macaw feather as a tail, as a whole feather. Uh, and then the wing itself was a little bit unusual as well. But when I took it apart again we found some unusual bits. So. Uh, I'm going to use the hook that it was tied on now. We've lost a little bit of the point of the hook here, but I'm uh, not overly worried about that. So I'm going to wax my tie and thread and take that down to the rear here. So the uh, tip on this fly was gold oval. And that was tied in at the side here. And what I think it was, although it was destroyed, um, it seemed to have been tied in and tied off at the same point, which to me suggests that it was one of these ones that was wrapped over itself. So I think to do that, what you need to do is take a turn over it of your tie-in thread and get it caught, then remove that and take it forward. And then once it has caught itself, the tension metal threads. Cut your tying thread. Take that forward. So on this one there's no, if I was tying that now I'd probably take the uh, ends of it up to here to where my uh, gut eye would end to help with the underbody but this is the way it was tied in. So next portion was uh, some galena. And that was tied on the far side sort of and tips down. Next was the unusual bit, the thing that attracted me to the fly, which was this. So this is the tip of a macaw covert. I'm going to use the original one. It's slightly damaged at the end, but looking at it, it was flattened in this line with the stock, so the feather was meant to be sitting straight up. To me that makes a very unusual tail set up for a fly, certainly one I haven't seen before. So, uh, next thing that was tied in then was a flat gold rib and that was tied in on my side. So we'll take that back to that point. Now, looking at the fly, uh, I thought it was a multi-floss, multi-coloured floss section uh, body moving then into like a dark green pig's wool. Um, but when I took it apart, only one strand of uh, of floss came off, and there was a you could see a gradation into the colour. So what I think has happened is that it has been like a light puce type colour, like a magenta. And then with the fly getting wet, etc., that the uh, dyes from the either the hackle or the uh, the pig's wool or whatever have leached backwards into it and had darkened because I thought it had gone from like a magenta into a really dark claret and then into the the fur portion, but it was one piece of thing. So, so I am going to go with this. 
Turkish magenta, whatever you want to call it, type. Uh, embroidery silk here. just wrapped from front to back it had gone back over itself and that's what we're going to Just going to let this hang here at this point. Because I'm going to attach the hackle. So ordinarily if I was tying it I'd have the hackle on by maybe the second turn of tinsel. But in this one it was third and there were also about six or so turns of tinsel on this fly. So I'm sort of extrapolating the colour of this here to be this sort of bright blue. It was hard to tell. It may have been darker but again the colours, the dyes from the pig's wool had leached into the hackle itself so I had a multicolored hackle as well but I think it was a lighter blue that had then become darker with the green moving into it from the from the fur section. So now we'll wax our tie and thread up again and I'm going to dub on this sort of it's a mixture I've made this mixture up of well it's seal but it's uh, like a Highlander on a dark olive. I'm going back over my floss portion a little bit and then traveling forward. Now we'll take our tinsel, lift the hackle up out of the way so we're not tying in, hopefully. whenever I move on to the uh, fur section what I tend to do is to take my first wrap further forward into it to get a bite of the fur and pull it back because it does tend to slip backwards on fur portions anyway so overestimate your first one um, and allow your uh, expecting it to slide further back into place if that makes sense rather than placing it and then finding that it does it of its own accord and gives you an unequal gap. So you can see there was quite a section at the front here to tie hackles etc on with. And we'll wrap our hackle now. So the hackle was in there with the uh, with the tinsel with the rib but then when we got in front of the uh, dubbed section 
there were then several wraps of hackle so they finished out the whole hackle so we're in front of it now so an extra one two three and a bit wraps So at this juncture now uh, there was a the first bit of a wing and that was I'm going to actually use the original bit that I took off here which seems to be a couple of slips which are in themselves folded it's hard, it may be hard to see they're sort of roofed individually but they were set on here and this appears to be like a cinnamon turkey uh, underwing or flat or whatever you want to call it. Not underwing, tail, pre tail or something like that to get it that soft. Okay. And then we had a teal hackle. So. I'm going to take a teal hackle. Now I have a video on wrapping duck but what you'll find with duck is that the front bits of it here are quite uh, straight and easy enough to double but then we start getting more and more curve as we move back. So this is going to be wrapping over this way so what I'll do is I'll strip off the leading edge for about half of the feather. This bit will double easily and this bit the curve in it will give me the nice shape to the throat as we wrap it. So I'll find my tip and then I'm just going to flip these fibers from the doubled portion back, therefore doubling the first section. And then we tie that in, flip it back on itself, and wrap this hackle. So I don't recognize the pattern yet, but I said if anybody does, let me know, I'd be interested. So you can see there that it gives me a nice, neat uh, wrapped throat when I do that uh, half stripping technique. So we tie that in, turn it off, and then. Um, if I can find my wax, which I don't know where I've put it. There it is. I'll wax that. And create a nice solid base here for tying the rest of the wing on. So looking at it, um I thought it was a two-sided uh, Shannon type wing when I looked at it first but then when I took it apart uh, we realized that it was like this this feather was sitting up on on it it looked like this but when I take it apart the way this one has been flattened is different to the way the tail so the tail was flattened to keep it in line like this whereas this one the stock had been flattened to do this with so this one has been damaged over the years so what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace it with this macaw feather here. I'm going to measure it up against this for lengthways and strip it back. And what I think had happened here is that this had been set up on top and then folded like this to tie in and then having been fished it had chosen a side then to lay on but I'm pretty sure that it was it was tied on like this like a shell as such and also because on top of it it had a golden pheasant breast feather which had been done the same. So there was fibers down each side of the wing. So this had gone on like this. And we'll trim off 
things. Tag out. And on top of it, there were two uh, blue and gold macaw fibers, or like horns, I suppose, but they were right on top of each other and there was only one side and there was no evidence that there had been any on the far side uh, and looking at it the, the wraps were very tight of the thread so I don't think it fell out and I didn't find any remnants of so I think it was just like this literally on top of it now whether that was you know an attempt at two horns and the tire just wasn't overly proficient at it and that's the way they did it but this is what it was so I'm going to trim that wax up my thread and bind this down nice and tight because we are now going to put on a black ostrich hurl head. Now this wasn't very evident whenever you initially looked at the fly because all of the little fibers near enough had fallen off it but when I started to take apart then it was evident that that's what it was. So I'll tie that in front and then Forge. Trim that. And what I do with hurl heads is I just lick my finger, get it wet stroke them back into position and then I'll put a little bit of uh, varnish onto the front bit there. They actually secure the tie-in. That is our fly tide. As I said, I have no idea what the pattern is, but uh, it strikes me as being a very unusual sort of uh, setup of a fly. It may have been a fly to fancy of the individual tire rather than a specific pattern, but uh, clearly it was tied with a purpose as it was well enough tied. Uh, so, as I said, if we like what we see, uh, give me a like, subscribe, tell your friends. Uh, check out the other videos that I've done. I have uh, quite a few videos now in the classic section of it. And uh, until next time, tight lines and thanks for watching.